as I was telling Abhi, I think it's my fault. It's Abu Tamim's fault that it's so <laughs> easy. To I'd like to thank Abhi and the Sultan Tobu's Cultural Center for this uh, invitation, for allowing me to speak to a captive audience about a poem that I love so much. Um, but before I do that, Abhi also put me on the spot and said, say something about yourself. So other than the fact that I'm a fan of Abu Tamim, I uh, teach Arabic uh, literature at the University of Pennsylvania. I have, uh, I think a lot about translating poetry and how challenging that is. It keeps me up at night. I am originally from Lebanon and I've been living in this country in translation for almost 15 years. Uh, most of my work recently is on modern Arabic poetry. I'm currently writing a book on the Arabic prose poem, something that Abu Tammam would have thought, would have liked, I think. He would have considered. He would, have, he would not have been too upset. Uh, but when Abir sent me her invitation and said, what is a poem you would like to read out loud in Arabic? It didn't take me too long to choose this poem. And I hope you'll see why. Uh, it's an honor for me to be speaking about this poem in front of Professor Suzanne Sekirich and Professor Yaroslav Sekirich. So everything that I will leave out or I will miss, I will refer you to their works on Arabic poetry, and especially Suzanne's work on Abu Tamam and the Abbasid age. So, Abu Tamam is an Abbasid muhdath poet. Right? And sometimes, and I do this, I translate the word muhdath as modernist, or modernizer, the Abbasid modernizers. These are, this is a, the muhdath period in Arabic poetry is a, is a phase that, that, that um, witnessed an astounding radical poetic movement. The Badia poetry of the Abbasid poets, as Suzanne Stakiewicz tells us, is, is a linguistic correlative to the unprecedented might and dominion of the Arabo-Islamic rulers. So these poets were able in their poetry to create a rival or a correlative for the height of Arabo-Islamic political and military power. But at the same time, these were artists who had complicated relationships with and who some relationships that were contradictory with power and with the multilingual, multi-ethnic societies they, they lived in. They intervened in the life of the Arabic language and created in their poetry linguistic events which are enduring in their consequences. All subsequent modernist projects in Arabic poetry conjure up the Abbasid moment, not as history or as a past now lapsed, but as a poetically charged moment, perpetually present. The Abbasid poets thus remain participants in the present moment of the past, if I am to borrow a phrase from T.S. Eliot. It is a moment that is not one of consecutive stations in the line of progression, but rather a moment from which time radiates in all directions. This is the very moment in which a poet stands at the intersection of beginnings and ends, and all of time radiates out to this poem. And this makes me think of a line by Abu Tamam himself, where he says, of a beauty, and I'm assuming, or I'm allowing myself to think that the subject of this line is poetry, of a beauty for which tomorrow yearns, and for which yesterday avidly longs. Yashtaquhu min kamalihi ghaduhu, wa yukfiru al-wajda nahwa wal if talking about poetry, Abu Tamam is inviting us in this line to reconsider the arbitrariness of historical periodization when applied to poetry. If a poem can only be read as a medieval poem, then it has failed as poetry and survived as something else. There is no time before or after the poem, both future and past, yearn for that moment in the present that collapses them into each other. In the verse above, both tomorrow, ghad, and ems, and yesterday, ems, are stimulated and moved to action by beauty, by the aesthetic imperative. The poetic event is what dictates the direction of time in this context. Unlike the historical imperative, the aesthetic imperative, as Abu Tamam shows us, can reconfigure poetry's relationship to history, poeticizing. And why am I telling you all this? Because I am thinking, I'm always thinking, about how to apply the term modernist with all its baggage 
to the ambassador, to ambassador posts. And I, some of my colleagues sometimes object to that. They think, of, think it anachronistic. I'll try to convince you, and you are free to object afterwards. What I, so what I'd like to focus on here in my comments, and I really like these to be just comments, observations, before I read the poem in Arabic, so Abu Tamam would have the last word, as he always does. But so I'd like to, to focus here on the adjective modernist, which is often used to describe the achievements of the Abbasid Muhtafin. Away from, aside from his, its historical or chronological denotation, when we use the word modernist, we are signaling a specific poetic attitude and a certain type of poetic engagement. And Abu Tamam's stance vis-a-vis -vis his tradition is that of a modernist par excellence. It is a relationship that is at once conflictual, intero interrogative, destructive, and creative. He and his generation of poets have succeeded by challenging their poetic tradition and rejecting some of its dimensions in preserving its enduring poetic core. He and other poets, such as the earlier Abu Muaz, the later Abu Mutanabbi, are the modernizers from which the Arabic free verse movement of the 20th century takes some of its cues. We continue to hear resonances of Abu Tamam's voice in, the 20th, in 20th century modern poetry, in Arabic and beyond. Many free verse poets in Arabic gesture towards Abu Tamam in their poetry in order to signal a poetic and a critical continuity. Abu Tamam's verses in description of spring, which are included in this poem, uh, which he wrote in praise of the Caliph al muqassim are some of his most memorable. They are often cited as examples of his unprecedented metaphors and his innovations of new meanings. In reading Abu Tamam's spring poem, and especially in attempting to translate it for today's reading, the challenge of metaphors stands out. It is a challenge to us as readers, to poets of his time and all times, but it's also a challenge to the patron, to the Caliph, as we will see. And thus, I read and translate this poem with an eye to metaphor. And I think here of modernist metaphor, as Abdelqahir Jurjani, or T.S. Eliot, or even as Mies, would describe it as the creation of new, unprecedented connections between things and ideas, connections which make up a rival new world, a correlative to the world we know, or a world worth the, the world that only exists in words, did not exist they were strung together. Uh, this is metaphor and metamorph metamorphosis, as Wallace Stevens sometimes prefers to call it. It is me metaphor which does not enunciate an identity but constructs a resemblance. And I'm quoting from Wallace Stevens. And a resemblance which completes and reinforces the two different things and what they have in common. It makes them shine. It discovers them anew. And the, and the poet, Wallace Stevens, continues and tells us in a poem of his titled, Someone Puts a Pineapple Together, he says, the poet must defy the metaphor that murders the metaphor. He seeks as image a second of the self. And Abu Tamim certainly defies metaphor that murders metaphor. His metaphors do not reduce the world, but multiply them. He offers in his poem a second or a double self of things, it is difficult to read this poem that I will read to you without being moved and incited to think not of new images or meanings, but more so new forms of thought. Abu Tamim, and especially in his description of spring, speaks of things that do not exist without words, or things that are the product of language thinking or stringing itself into new forms that produce unprecedented meanings. Before I go on, a note on translation. I told you it's an obsession of mine. It's a, and all of you who work in the field of literature, whether Arabic or any other uh, peripheral nascent literature in the world today, you struggle with translation in general. It's an impossible thing to do. But with poetry, it's even more. It's, it, it's, all, it's devastating to try to translate a poem, especially a poem you believe in, you love, you like, and so you feel like you're silencing. The decontextualized translations which present themselves as faithful or accurate while obscuring their role as interventions or rewritings or rereadings are insidious and oppressive because in Arabic, 
The phone can speak for itself, and its reader is responsible to listen to one or many of its voices. But in translation, the voice of the poem is not all carried across. As we welcome the advanced poets into English, such as Abu Tamam, and onto the global stage or the stage of world literature and other very insidious and problematic labels, we should attempt translations of Arabic poetry, especially medieval poetry, which aim at that distant meaning. Which aim at that distant meaning the poem acquires from its context and the poetic landscape it throws out and into. Even if we decide to explore the original creative terms that translation can take, one, when one decides to decontextualize or de-territorialize de it, shouldn't we first acquaint ourselves with the context before we abandon it? So a translator can only tap into the creative potential of his poem in translation, or her, if she sees herself as a student of that whole tradition and not as a creator of figures or works of choice. On one hand. On the other hand, we should also think of the poem, just as we think of every poem as a reconfiguration of its whole tradition, we should also think of the translation as reconfiguring the target tradition as well, participating actively and not just sitting on the margin. The effort to imagine roots for the translated poem in the target language will result in layered textual, textured translations that make meaningful connections and pave the way for a vibrant conversation between the two traditions. Even if the end results are always going to be lacking, the effort to make them complete is enough to transform what we do from translation of poetry into translation as poetry. So I sit to translate this poem. And this is what I did. So this is me uh, revealing some of my tricks, which might have failed, but this is what I did. I conjured up examples of modernist metaphor in English that can be of assistance to me as I read me my English for a and I'm always very conscious of my English, it's a second language, so there are layers of consciousness and hesitation, and I blush for no reason, but here I have reason to sometimes when translating. So I think of poets like Wallace Stevens, like Seamus Heaney, like Philip Larkin. I conjure up poets, and this conjuring up of names like these is not to suggest that English has claim to modernist metaphor or to modernism that I'm borrowing and imposing on Arabic. No, this is an exercise for the benefit of English. It's an exercise for the benefit of the translator. By calling up poets who, like Abu Tammam, have, have twisted their language's neck, offering metaphors like his that tug at the thoughts or the forms of our thoughts. So when Wallace Stevens invites us to behold the nothing that is not there and the nothing that is, I hear an echo of Abu Tammam. When Philip Larkin sees the trees coming to leaf like something almost being said, I hear an echo of Abu Tamam. So thus, I surrounded myself with Stephen's Snowman and Philip Larkin's Trees and a great poem by Seamus Heaney titled Mint. And I sat to think of, to put my English in the mind of Abu Tamam. So this is a no prompt translation. Why did I choose this poem? And I think somebody in the audience, or Muhammad, already asked me, why this poem? Growing up, I always, in my mind, I believed, I was certain, that the magic of poetry, the transformation that poetry can, can make happen, all sit in the lines that Abu Tammam composes in description of rain in this poem. It is not just about the meaning, the meanings that unfold in your mind or the things that are turning into their opposites, but also the sound. Sound first and foremost, the music of words that participates in the making of meaning in this poem. And this is a poem, it's a, it's a classical poem, it's a qasida, and you have a monometer and a mono rhyme, but still, they all, make, they all have meaning, they all participate in creating this survival world that is a better world sometimes, and is there to challenge the world of faith, as we will see in a minute. The poem is a, is a praise poem addressed to the most powerful man on, in the world at that time, the Caliph al muqtasim And it, it's clearly divided into two sections. If we're going to run down the structure of this poem, and I'm not going to detail, 
we can easily divide it into two sections. An opening section which describes the advent of spring and the transformation of the world into a spectacle, from line 1 to 22, and then a praise section that begins at line 22 and goes on until the end, line 32, in which Abutaman praises the caliph and compares him to spring. So that's pretty straightforward. There's an interjection, an interruption in the first section at line 8, where Abu Tamer reveals the connection between the two sections. His direct address to the caliph here does more than just reveal that connection between the two parts of the poem. It calls upon the poem, it calls upon the caliph and puts him on the spot by addressing him as, as spring, you are our spring, by addressing him that way in the midst of this astounding description of spring's power to mold time and smooth out its jagged edges, the stakes of, are set in this place. The caliph is being challenged here and his power confronted and balanced not only against spring, but more so against the power of metaphor that is able to portray spring in this way. This poem, especially in its second section, performs the traditional well-recognized ritual of praise, in this case, praising the most powerful man in the world. However, in its, at its subtext, the, at the subtext of this poem, Abu Tamim flaunts the power of metaphor in the face of political military power. He confronts political power with the power of metaphor as its equal, as its rival, and even at, 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 as its better in ordering, disordering the world, capturing it, and raiding it. The two rivals revealed here in this poem thus are poetry or metaphor on one side and time and history on the other. And there is nothing more powerful than the invitation to look in this poem in line 11 to 13. <laughs> The expanse of line 11, which harnesses the sound of the duel in Arabic, comes at a crucial point in the poem and plays an important role in setting up the phrase. Before we turn to the patron and what he has done and what he can do and what we hope he will do, we pause here at the work of spring which shapes and transforms the whole world for us. We are invited to look and see the world fashioned as if for the first time. The sound and the sound and the gaze that accompany us as we look is singularly of the man. It is as if a curtain is being pulled and the whole world is revealed to you. Look, here it is, transformed into something other than itself. It is this presence of spring and this consequence of spring that the caliph should aspire to emulate if he were to live up to this praise. And since it is a spring only revealed in Abu Tamam's poetic language, it is the power of metaphor that is presented as a challenge. So Abu Tamam, before he goes on to praise the, the king as just and generous, he unsheathes the, safe, the, the sword of the safe, the sword of the metaphor, and challenging, challenges him not to be like spring, but even more, can you become a metaphor, is the challenge. When we arrive at his work, at the patron's work, which is praised as unforgettable, lasting across the stretch of time in line 24, we are acutely aware that it is the power of this poem that can achieve that for the patron. I will not comment on every line, and I'm really eager to read, but I will comment on one line. The very first line in the poem. And I have to say that in translating this poem, I benefited from an earlier full translation of this poem done by Julia Gray and published in the Journal of Arabic Literature in 1994. And because the Abu metaphor is a complex knot of associations, knowing a complex knot of associations where she drew out one strand, I intentionally tried to draw out another, knowing that both or all are present in the end. Uh, with Gray's translation in mind, I also imagined myself participating in a tradition of translation for this poem, 
in hope of arriving at something that might equal the original. So the more translations of this poem, the better, I think, for English, for the sanity of all of us who try to read it in English. So where she translates the first line, رَقَّتْ حَوَاشِفْ دَهِ الْفَهْلِ يَتَمَرْمَرُ وَغَدَتْ تَرَى فِي حَيِّهِ يَتَكَسَّرُ Where she translates the first uh, shuffle, رَقَّتْ حَوَاشِفْ دَهِ Thinking of the image of cloth and trims of a dress, حَوَاشِ Swaying and quivered and quivering, رَقَّتْ حَوَاشِفْ دَهِ الْفَهْلِ يَتَمَرْمَرُ I see stone. I've always read this line as a little girl, this thinking that marmar, that marble, had something to do with this. And I was always disappointed when the, the shuruf didn't mention any of that. They always talked about dresses and trims of dresses. Um, but I cannot shake off the association with mar with marble or marma. I like the image of marble being worked and smoothed out as in sculpture. So my initial translation, which is not in your hand, handout, was the edges of time now rounded like marble. I opted against that for one reason, because it includes a simile. And I thought that Abu Tamim's metaphor is more direct and sudden and immediate, and a simile would weaken that. But if I were given room to comment on the first line of its translation, I would still defend my decision to see stone. In my mind, time, especially Arabic poetic time, the time in the Arabic poetic landscape is jagged. It's sharp, it's pointy. It is the agent that wears out everything else and smooths sto smooth stone. We're thinking of a flood. In the background of all of this, stone imagery is crucial to the qasida, especially the opening. Stone is always the witness to the work of time that it proves to us what time can do and what it has done. And here in this poem, it's a very beautiful inversion, it's an unsatisfying inversion to see time itself as the stone that's being worked. So it's as if the figure of time has been rounded like marble. Just like spring transforms the world into something other than itself, this poem by Abu Tamim presents to us time like it had never seen itself before, especially in an Arabic poem. Time in this poem is unlike time in any other Arabic poem. The afflictions and the vicissitudes and the calamities, which usually open the archetypal qasida, are only negated at the very end. And another crucial station in this poem is line 28, where he says, which uh, this is again the inversion, Sakanat Zaman. Sakanat Zaman, Fala Yedun, Majmumatun, Lil Hadithat, Wala Sawan, Yubad. Time has been reined in and tamed and smoothed and made to obey. And thus, time here submits to poetry, to metaphor. It surrenders and submits to the new aesthetic imperative. So these are my thoughts on the poem. And I will read it to you now, unless you have some questions or comments. So this is the test. After all this, I will read the poem to you. And let's, uh, and then we'll have a little conversation. Right there. And I, I'd be very curious to hear your uh, comments on the translation. This is very much a work in progress. And uh, another note, you might have the Arabic, which is full of typos, so excuse that. It's, I got it somewhere on the internet. Never trust any website <laughs> that has a poem in Arabic, classical or modern. If it's never trusted, go back to your grammar book. رَقَّتْ حَوَاشِ الدَّهِ الْفَهْيَ يَتَمَرْمَرُ وَغَدَ الثَّرَى فِي حَلِّهِ يَتَكَسَّرُ نزلت مقدمة المصيف حميدة ويد الشتاء جديدة لا تكفر لولا الذي غرس الشتاء بكفه لاقى المصيف هشائما لا تثمر كم ليلة آسى البلاد بنفسه فيها ويوم وابنه متعنجر 
مطر مطر يذوب الصحو منه وبعده مطر يذوب الصحو منه وبعده صحو يكاد من الغدار الضيوف غيثان غيثان فالانوار غيث ظاهر لتوجهه والصحو غيث مهمل وندى اذا ادهنت به لما مشترى خلت السحاب اتاه وهو معذر اربيعنا في تسع عشره حجه حقا لهنك للربيع الازهر ما كانت الايام تسلب بهجه لو ان حسن الراضي كان يعمر اولا ترى الاشياء ان هي غيرت سمجا وحسن الارض حين تغير يا صاحبي تقصيا نظرتما ترى يا وجوه الارض كيف تصور ترى يا نهارا مشمسا قد شابه زهر الرضا فكانما هو مكمل دنيا دنيا معاش للورى حتى اذا جلي الربيع فانما هي منظر اضحت تصوب بطونها لظهورها نورا تكاد له القلوب تنور من كل زاهره ترقرق بالندى فكانها عين عليه تحذر تبدو ويحجبها الجميم كانها عذراء تبدو تاره وتخفر حتى غدت وهداتها ونجادها فئتين في قلع الربيع تبخر مصفره محمره فكانها عصب تيمم في الوغى وتمضر من فاقع غض النبات كانه در يشقق قبل ثم يزعفر او صافع في حمره فكانما يدنو اليه من الهواء معصفر صنع الذي لولا بدائع صنعه ما عاد اصفر بعد اذ هو اخضر خلق اطل من الربيع كانه خلق الايمان وادب المتيسر في الارض من عدل الايمان وجوده ومن النبات الغض سرج تزهر تنسى الرياض وما يروض يروض فعله ابدا على مر الليالي يذكر ان الخليفه حين يظلم حادث عين الهدى وله الخلافه محجر كثرت به حركاتها ولقد ترى من فتره وكانها تتفكر ما زلت اعلم ان عقده امرها في كفه مذ خليت تتخير سكن الزمان سكن الزمان فلا يد مذمومه للحادثات ولا سوام يذعر نظم البلاد فاصبحت وكانها عقد وكان العدل فيه جوهر لم يبق مبدا لم يبق مبدا موحش الا ابتوى بذكره الا ابتوى من ذكره لم يبق مبدا موحش الا ابتوى من ذكره فكانما هو محفر ملك ملك يظل الفخر في ايامه ويقل في نفحاته ما يكثر فليعسرنا فليعسرنا على الليالي بعده ان يبتلى بصدورهن المعاصر she tends to translate it in meter okay and that is a, a, a very impressive thing to do it does not always succeed though right because it becomes much more forced it's not really forced here right so yeah that's something to think about because ultimately the goal is to, to come out to leave the translation table with a poem in english like that is the, the goal that doesn't always happen it rarely happens it might never happen okay, but you want to to have a text that you can read and enjoy the sound of in english so that's a, a good goal to 
question about your process because at the beginning you said um, these are the things that keep me up at night. So when you are in the type of work that you're in and you're translating poems, um, are you ever finished? Or no. are you ever satisfied? No, that's why I mentioned the idea of participating in a tradition, thinking that this is one block in a structure that you hope we will end up with. Many translations that will end up creating the reputation that has fallen in English. And this is very crucial for uh, literary traditions like Arabic in the world today, where translation has power, more power. So and this is an example I always give. So people who know me are probably bored of it. So we don't need, when, when somebody says, I'm going to translate the Odyssey, nobody's worried. Because Homer can defend himself. There are millions of translations, we don't get many translations out there, that will judge the new translation. Homer is safe. Whereas if you say, I'm translating Abu Tamam, I'm translating Shankar, I'm translating Bashar al then that's it. This is going to be Bashar al representative in English. And we are going to distort it, what distort can once and for all. So there's a need for translations, more translations from these peripheral, as they're called, liter uh, literary traditions. And this applies to modern as well. So there are very, very little, very, very few translations of poetry. The, the case in, in the novel is different. Mm -hmm. right? But with poetry, the violence that happens in translation is much more, it's deeper and much more lasting mm -hmm. in creating the reputation of these works in the other language. So I'm of the so you feel that like I'm of the responsibility, I think. <laughs> well, yes, well, yeah. especially towards the poets I, I'm working on, because I, yeah, there is responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Shum's question, and most of my questions are already quite strange, um, in the sense that they tend to be have pieces that come together. So the first question is, do you think about time or stone as the edges is either rough or smooth or both all. Somehow we think of stone as being a cleaning agent, like it's water rushing through it. And so I'm thinking about that metaphor and time are working with the stone or through the stone. How are you imagining like the ideal poem coming out? Because in spring, the you know this leader is basically bringing life back, which is of course like something in nature. So how do you, how do you, think, how do you, how do you think that comes together in a poem? Right. Is that a weird question? It is weird. Yeah. It is good. Yeah. <laughs> this is the most that word. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So water and stone working together. See, the thing that's being, uh, that the caliph is being confronted with in this poem is the power of nature, right? That, that is, what, what is I forget the line, but something that Bashar al-Burd says, that at the end what remains is a qasid, right? Everything will be worn out. So he's telling him, your presence is as uh, transient as anything that water is going to wash away, springs are going to change, seasons are going to change, even stone will be worn out, as happens in the Qadr. But, but the agent that's new here is metaphor, that is going to keep all of that. Timeless, really. So the, the, the memory of the caliph, this description of spring that we sit here in Washington DC talking about today, right? so the, the catalyst, the magic, the ingredient that makes this unlike anything else is this type of metaphor. Right? It's metaphor in general, but this type of metaphor especially. I hope I answered your question, but even if I did, I'll take it with me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and compare it with this one yes. with regards to two things. The first you. one, the one that you just mentioned that you didn't want to like, annoy us with mm -hmm. even deeper in it, which is the hidden feeling of bitterness in this uh, poem. And the, uh, the, the, the spring is just there to cover it. Yes. And it's there in the very first line. And you mentioned Kawesh and Dada, and I would also mention Atta, which is usually uh, related to Al Naut. But I will also talk about the uh, poetic story of Abu Tamam and how much in this poem 
you need to compromise its words to match the famous of one of the Bakhtori Yes. Yes, I agree. So you're best. No, no, let me comment on it. No, no, I agree with you. I, I see. I like to uh, read a little bit of bitterness in every prose poem, especially by the poets I know. So you'd like to think that this uh, that Abu Tamam, well, he doesn't walk into the presence of uh, Muqtas, and you know he stays to the side, right? So he's watching. He's watching. Uh, has a feeling. So we're imagining. This is fantasy. Now we're imagining that he thinks himself better than this man. So every poet and every politician. And as uh, Suzanne, Professor Suzanne Stetkevich, shows us in the exchange of the, of the praise, there's always a threat that's embedded there. So this is going to turn on you if you don't live up to it. So I'm the one who's here to set the challenge for you, the bar. This is what you should be. You live up to it, you fail or you succeed. The poem that's, that's uh, here to judge you so yes, I see that. And, and, and the fact that the metaphor here is so astounding, so powerful, so mind-blowing. And then the praise, which is you're just, you're good, you deserve the position. It seems very little in comparison to thinking of يَكْفِرُ وَيَقِلُّ فِي نَفَحَاتِهِ مَا يَكْفِرُ أَبُو تَمَّامْ يَقِلُّ فِي نَفَحَاتِهِ مَا يَكْفِرُ مِشُ الْمُعْتَصِمْ So I, I like to see that tension, and I agree with you. Buhtari's Rabia is present when you read this poem. And again, that's another thing I like to imagine and keep in the, in the back of my mind, that these poets were really writing for each other, right? and the, the caliph was an excuse and the source of income. But, so this is really a, a conversation between poets. Buhtari and Abu Tammam were always thinking of each other. Buhtari probably thinking of Abu Tammam more. But there's someone in this poem there's someone else later who's thinking about them, who's Abu Tamam. So speaking of what happens to time, Abu Tamam tells us, Sakan and Salman of Tala Yadun Mahmumat and Lil Hadithati Wada Sawan and Yudadu. Abu Tamam becomes and says, Jama has a man of Tala Labibun Khalis of Mimma Yashub, Wala Surun Khali, Wala Surun Kamil. Jama has a man of Tala Labibun Khalis of Mimma Yashub, Wala Surun Kamil. He takes the line, he rewrites it with exactly the opposite meaning. If you're only reading a Mutanabbi's line, you think this is Zaman as we know it in the pre Islamic Tasnifa, Jamah, uh, dominating, destroying, we submit to it. But it, no, it's not. This is Zaman, time after it had passed through the lens of Abu Tamman, because Mutanabbi is specifically rewriting Abu Tamman's line. So he's taking time that Abu Tamman set in, Sakan Zaman. He's, he's allowing us to become Jam again. So that idea of poets writing for each other, writing on the top of each other's poems, is also probably most prominent in reading the works of all of these poems. Yes. Just can't resist throwing in a word or two. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation and this wonderful translation of this poem. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I think translations are, are one way that make a poem come alive because you see someone really interacting with it, really trying to figure out um, every little detail of the meaning and what it could mean or that sort of thing. So it's not only a beautiful translation, it's very engaging and compelling. Uh, and also looking at a translation to the reading of the poem. I just want to point out um, a couple other aspects of the poem when we look at it within the whole tradition, um, and this might have something to do with the idea of titles too. I find titles kind of annoying because traditionally Arab poems did not have a title. They might be referred to kind of oh, it's a spring poem or his uh, Amoria poem. That's not officially a title. The way uh, in English a poet often very has a very intentional title that, that directs us toward. Uh, but of course, the problem was that within the Arabic tradition, people knew the tradition and they, they already know what a panegyric poem is, what a praise poem uh, to a uh, caliph is going to be. They're already so oriented in so many ways to what's going to happen. And the mm -hmm. problem with translating is how do you, in some kind of title, uh, 
engage the English reader to an understanding of this whole world of poetry. When you can camp entirely, but edges of time is not a bad idea. Uh, the moment that he ad addresses here, I think also, is one, if you remember, what I always notice, there's a day of spring when you suddenly go out and you feel as though you're being caressed instead of going out like this all winter. And I think that's what this collage is, the dahak, this dahak, which means like time, but it's also kind of the weather and the seasons and all these things um, as well. So there's something there. Uh, the other thing is the very old and archetypal image of the ruler and the fertility cycle that the traditional ancient Middle Eastern king uh, represented time overcoming seasonal changes and therefore being a perpetual spring, which is a uh, very pre-Islamic mm -hmm. um, epithet for somebody too. There's, uh, I think it's Rabia Asa'ili, the springtime for the beggars. Uh, the idea that a man who was so wealthy that he could give people plenty, he could feed the poor mm -hmm. all year long. Yeah. So it's quite a moving, and it's very interesting because to us it's very lyrical, but in the Arabic content, context, the ruler at springtime is uh, more moral and lyrical. It's having the, ge the, the, gen the power to own a lot and to have the generosity to provide for everyone all year long. So the, the combination of the lyrical and the, and the sort of moral and archetypal, um, I think is very interesting here. And then especially as you pointed out, when he calls him, uh, this is this must have been this must have been a great moment of court. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, I think this is great. Uh, I think this is great. But uh, but oh, what I was going to say in, in, in terms of the power play between the poet and the caliph, uh, one thing I want to say is that it had to be known from the beginning that he, to the audience that when he's talking about spring, he's talking. So the real thing here is, can the caliph live up to this mm -hmm. image? It also reminded me of what they always all say in the Ajaz al Quran. And the uh, Ajaz uh, uh, al al hakika. The metaphorical speech is more powerful than literary, literary speech. So the imaging of the caliph of spring and the achievement of this met metaphor is more powerful praise to the caliph himself than merely saying, Oh, you're so powerful. Yeah, for so something like yeah. that. So I, I think to understand it from the very beginning that spring is the caliph is um, uh, kind of essential to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, one thing I would warn against, not every poet is Mutanebi. Uh, Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. OK, so Mutanebi creates a persona for, for himself, which may or may not be and it's certainly there in his poetry mm -hmm. of this brash and I am better than you and you know uh, his relationship to his patrons is he always uh, uh, portrays himself as being somehow superior somehow having the, the upper hand mm -hmm. well first of all politically he did because there were no political strong men at this mm -hmm. time nobody had that kind of upper hand with Anwar yeah. it was a very uh, he, he was a very tough guy uh, and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, I don't think we want to project, I think modern poetry, most of us, I call it like the junior high school approach to poetry, which is where we all learn to love poetry. Because that's when you start loving poetry when you're 12, 13, 14, is this romantic figure of the poet. Now, Mutanabe creates such a romantic figure that appeals to us as moderns in this, we'd like to be post-romantic, but we're probably not. But I don't think we should be projecting that back um, on other poets or poets generally, nor, even more important, our own distaste for court poetry yes. uh, should not lead us to, to, uh, to kind of, how do you say it, real, to kind of excuse poets by making up, oh, he didn't really mean that, or he was really, um, certainly they were not as object in their court poetry. Probably a lot of them were. The great ones somehow go beyond that simply because their poetry mm -hmm. is greater than any of the political circumstances they were involved with. But I think to try to 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 um, uh, resurrect them as great romantic figures 
treading on rather dangerous ground. And I think also for, for Everton Man, whose poetry is so abstracted, I think of him as having a very abstract metaphorical mind. It's yes. hard to imagine him. Yeah, he's not a romantic. He, he's more of an academic, you know, like an assistant professor in a tenure track. Yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> abstract. Oh, oh, yes. but, he, but very, very engaging in the abstract. Yes, yeah, definitely. And, but also then relating to what you said, though, very engaged in the power of language. Yes, um, and this is why he made me, or I thought it would be helpful to think of people like Walter Stevens, uh, poets who are very abstract in what they do with metaphor. You're right. It's, it's probably uh, problematic to try to romanticize them. But this poem, especially this poem, unlike the Amor Amoria poem, in this poem, it, there is this imbalance between what he does with metaphor and spring. And definitely the, the fertility images is all, uh, imagery is all there and the praise. And uh, say that I were trying to imagine that it's a man bitter for our own benefit. Like we, this is our fantasy. How to, had to relate to parts of this poem that, frankly, I there are parts of this poem that I don't like, especially the Tayamman and Tamoto part. There are images that seem to be, I don't know, much uh, flatter than the others, actually. So the, the, yes, I would not defend uh, a persona, me constructing a persona of a Tayamman that's similar to Mutanabe. You're right. Well, and I don't think that's a person. Right. Mutanabe constructed his own persona. He did. He believed yes. he really like that or not, but he did. You can't avoid it in reading his poetry. No, I don't think yeah. Yeah. Uh, But the man, whatever he was actually like, it's not recorded for us. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Because in his poetry, one doesn't get a sense. I mean, I spent my youth on every time man, and I never felt any sense of being close to as a person. I just felt, which is how I thought I would start out. I thought it was going to write some kind of sentimental novel. I was a young girl. I know what's happening. This was decades ago. Uh, you know, and then I got into the poetry more and more, and you become more and more, you know, kind of a sort of an engineer. <laughs> 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 anyway, I think it's time for me to stop. Thank you very much. This is very nice. Yeah. If I may, I mean, maybe uh, uh, context. I mean, obviously, you mentioned context. Context is very important. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can help us also appreciate this more if you. Um, Give us an idea about the history, when was this poem said, what happened before, what happened after it. Was he famous as a court poet at that time? Is that relevant? There, I don't, is it relevant? What do you think? It's a good question. Uh, I don't really know much details. There are people, authorities in the room who, but Abu Kamal was the, 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 the most prominent poet of his time, and he was the poet of democracy. He was the caliph. Khalifa, and this this is the highest position a poet can have. So he is the poet of the court. Yes, and what is the specific occasion of this poem? I'm not sure. It's a poem in praise of a democracy. So unlike other poems where there is an occasion, a battle or a victory of some sort, I'm not sure what the occasion is here. But but when we're talking about power dynamics, we're talking about a period where Arab Islam hegemony was at its height. So the, the Khalifa was the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. Yes. And this was his poet praising him. So there is that dynamic of power between them. I don't think more context is necessary, especially if we're reading this as poetry, not as something else. Unless anybody else has any other details about the context. You mentioned at the beginning a uh, multilingual aspect to this poem. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss that a little more. I mean, obviously, at the height of the power, you may have possible Persian influence, or could you be able to articulate a little bit more on the multilingual aspect of this poem? Not this poem. I was, I was referring to the multilingual aspect of, the, of Abbasid society. Okay. So people were knew other languages, were exposed to other languages. That with, with Abu Tamam, we know that the critics uh, find fault with him or praise him for coining new words, right? So, Mut'anjiru is a word that he gets credit for. Uh, so, these poets were also involved in this practice of coining new words, intervening in the language to that extent. 
the other best poets might have also spoken and written in other languages. We know the earlier Bashar bin Gurd was of Persian descent and we would brag of the, his poetry. Um, I think Muhtanabi might have had, uh, included some Persian words and some uh, verses when he was praising rulers in Persia. So there is that infiltration, of course, and an influence between the poetic traditions as well, but not, not this one. Thank you. Thank you. Time. <laughs> I like how you're rolling into my comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. Because, again, there is a power dynamic in translation, right? And Arabic is a weaker language when it comes to English, right? And, and you know, in translation studies, we talk about domesticating and foreignizing, whether we're, well, we're, we are translating to satisfy the palate of the English reader, or are we translating to shock the English reader? to make him or her think or see English as, as she's never seen it before. So I like that inversion of holding the target language uh, up to the poem and not the other way around, especially in cases like this, where the, to start off with, the Arabic poem is already at a, at a disadvantage. Not just because it's Arabic and we don't have enough translations from Arabic poetry, but because this is a classical poem as well. Even for re a readership in Arabic, a classical poem is at a disadvantage. Yeah? And people have this assumptions about what classical poetry is, right? That it's formulaic, it's traditional, there's nothing that's going to shock you. And that's not true. Right? So, but so with English, I think it's necessary to back up the, to be on the side of the poem as opposed to being the monster. So it, it was really um, very good that um, that today you know that we are to listen to that. I hope that uh, for those of us who you know cannot comment on the translation, um, if you could perhaps say a few words about uh, how you memorized it and was this something that the family was more and more interested in it. And then the other part that I wanted to ask you was you mentioned something about um, about taking this kind. From the internet and how dangerous it is because of, you know, we don't know what comes in and what kind of content it is. Yeah. So we are speaking to Arabic, and I'm wondering if you, could, if you have some good suggestions for us where to look and how to make sure that so <laughs> many read what. And guys, thank you very much for your prompt. And when it comes to poetry, I think you need to have uh, use your grammar book as a shield. Even when you're reading in print, there are always typos, even in print. But in the, on the internet, it's, it's much worse, especially with poetry. There are many problems with the text. But you don't need, it, it shouldn't be a problem if you know your grammar well, right? <laughs> that is your uh, lifeline. Yes, I can't really say more about why the internet's so problematic. But about <laughs> memorizing, yes, this is a poem that I've known and I've read for a very long time. So I haven't memorized all of it, but there are parts of it that yeah, are always playing in my head. And I, I, I relate to that, a father going into a trance reading poetry. I think we, some of us in this room have figures like that in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
each other tonight. Um, I have a few announcements for upcoming programming. We have a money cultural evening on Tuesday, the 16th. That's next week. Um, it's open.